So you didn't get a 3080 like you hoped. And if you're like a lot of people on my Twitter feed, you're, you're saying, you know what, screw it. I'll just buy a cheap used 2080 Ti because there's a million of those up on eBay and might as well at least get something for my money. Well, that got me thinking. There's people out there that are gonna prey on people like you. So today we're gonna arm you with the information you need to not get ripped off by that skeevy goiter stabber used parts guy trying to pull one over on you. Skeevy goiter stabber. Don't get goiter stabbed. EVGA is proud to announce their all-new XR1 OBS certified 4K capture card. Record at 1080p60 while you game at 4K60 with HDR with advanced pass-through mode that allows you to switch to 144Hz refresh rate at the press of a button, meaning no longer do you need to disconnect or disable to get the full capabilities of your display. To see the full list of capabilities and configurations, click the EVGA link in the description below. Now we're not gonna cover every single part you could possibly buy, but we're gonna cover the main components because those are going to be the most expensive things in your system. So we're gonna talk about motherboards, both AMD and Intel, graphics cards, memory, CPUs, uh, what to look for. Now let's go ahead and start off with the complete system. That one should be pretty much a no-brainer. This is gonna be kind of like going to buy a used car and not taking it for a test drive. We wanna see it running. You want to make sure that if they say it's got blah, blah, blah parts in it, that you can go into Windows and actually see all of those parts in action. So you're going to want to check, obviously, the amount of RAM. You want to check the speed of the RAM, check the CPU, the core count, go into the BIOS and take a look there because you can't cheat in the BIOS. Pretty much it's going to tell you exactly what's identified during initialization. And that should be pretty much a no-brainer. A no if the person is like, oh no, it's already unhooked and already unpacked and stuff, and they're not willing to plug it in and turn it on, oh, I don't have a monitor. I'll bring my own monitor. Oh, I don't know. I mean, we're, we need to meet up at like a Starbucks or something. Like Starbucks has power plugs. Well, maybe it's probably harder right now than, than before, I guess. But there are ways. And the more you find someone kind of pushing back against your desire to see it running and test it, that's a deal worth walking away from. Even if they start blowing up your phone, hey, that's, I promise it works. So it's just, I'll give you your money back if something... Don't ever trust that guy. Literally, that's the guy that you just walk away from and say, thanks, have a nice day, con someone else. So having a complete system is probably the easiest way to make sure you don't get duped because of the fact that you can see it all running. The challenge comes when you're buying individual parts. Now this is something that um, when we were doing the Scrapyard Wars challenge with, uh, with Linus Tech, and so Luke and I were on a team versus um, Linus and Dimitri from Hardware Canucks, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major stress because of the fact that we're having to find the best deals we can. And oftentimes the best deals are gonna come from a couple of different scenarios. People that are looking to upgrade their system and just get a quick return on the cost that they just spent. So oftentimes you'll find someone, like me, I'm that person, I, I rarely try and get what something's actually worth. I'm like, what's it worth? All right, let's knock like 20% off of that and let's just move it quick. And that's usually where it's a good score. The problem is you're gonna find a lot of people that are also selling cheap because there's something wrong with it and they wanna unload it quickly and they don't want to be honest about it, because if they're like, hey, one of these fans on the graphics cards don't turn, although someone like me could actually probably fix that and or find a, another cooler to put on it or something, the average consumer is probably not willing to do all that and he's not gonna mention it, you're gonna get home and it's just not working. So that's some of the risks involved when you buy individual parts that it's very difficult to test. I am capable of putting together a system, a test system, that's just basic CPU, RAM, memory, motherboard, graphics card, cardboard box even, power supply, and be like, okay, if we're buying a graphics card, do you care, are you okay with me bringing a test system to plug it in and check it? Obviously, that's a very safe way of testing components. If you can bring something that you can then just plug the part in and test it. Most people don't have the ability to do that. So let's go ahead and start with AMD components because I feel like that's gonna be kind of like the main, I don't know, if we've, our React videos have taught us anything, it's that I feel like AMD systems right now are like nine to one over Intel. And so I figured that's where we'll look because there's a lot of people getting ready to sell their 3000 series CPUs because 4000 series is being announced on October 7th. A lot of those people also too might be running an older like B450 or 470 motherboard or whatever the chipset is and are looking to sell their motherboard CPUs as a package. So let's start with the CPU. One thing you have to understand about Intel is those are LGA pin sets. And what that means is the pins are located on the motherboard. 
AMD, on the other hand, is not. And I forget what it's called. Phil, do you remember what it's called when the pins are on the, on the actual CPU? It's not LGA. I can't remember. Does it matter? It doesn't really matter. All of the pins are located on the CPU. So one of the things you're gonna to wanna to do is you wanna take the CPU, hold it up to some light, and you're gonna to wanna to look exactly down the plane of the substrate. This is the substrate, the flat part that everything's attached to. That's known as the substrate. So you wanna hold that horizontal to your vision and just kind of rotate it. And you wanna look for any pins that are bent. And you can do this in both planes and look like turn it 90 and then do it again, but anything that's bent will show up on any plane that you look at it, actually, any, any direction. And you wanna look for any bent pins. Secondly, you wanna look at the top and look at any obvious signs of pins that have been re-straightened. Now, although we have done a guide on here showing you how I use a razor blade to re-straighten bent pins, the amount of people that have thanked me for that video because it, had, it, it saved them from what they thought was a dead CPU because they were, weren't careful and they dropped it, these things are like cats. They always land face down pin side down. And when that happens, these are just tiny little pieces of gold and copper and it's very soft metal. Usually you can fix it and bend it back once. And if you try it again, they'll snap off. The problem is if you straighten it back out, although they'll make contact correctly inside of the socket, they're never gonna look perfectly uniform on top again. So you wanna look for signs of a CPU that has had pins re-straightened. Unfortunately, I don't have any here to show you and I'm not gonna bend some pins to bend back for the sake of the video. But through the magic of Google image search, this is what a re-straightened Ryzen or FX or AMD, any AMD CPU uh, with re-straightened pins looks like. You can see it's not perfectly uniform like it is before there's any sort of damage to it. Um, there's no reason to believe it doesn't necessarily work if the pins are bent, but you certainly are gonna wanna press to see it functioning and you certainly are gonna to wanna to haggle the price no matter what it is if the pins have been bent. Now that brings us to the AMD motherboards, which means there's a lot less that could go wrong with an AMD motherboard versus an Intel motherboard because of the fact that if you look at the CPU socket, you can see that it's just nothing but a bunch of recessed holes because of the fact that the pins are on the CPU like we just showed you. But things you're gonna to wanna to check for with an AMD motherboard. Does it have the retention clips? A lot of AMD motherboard uh, coolers or CPU coolers remove these clips and use their own backplate and stuff. But a lot of them still use this. Now this is something that people will often take off and just chuck in the trash. Cause they're like, I'm never gonna go back to a stock cooler. That's stupid. So they'll just throw them away. Or like me, throw them in a bin and then lose them later and then need them and can't find them. So if they're missing that retention bracket, it's not a problem. It just means you wanna make sure that whatever cooler you get has its own self-contained retention system. And then of course you're gonna to wanna to haggle the price a bit more if it's missing that. Um, you wanna make sure that all of the pins inside the PCI Express are straight. There's no sort of foreign debris in there. There's no... So when we've done our overclocking challenges and we've used paper towel, like blue paper towel to stuff around areas to make it insulated so that if water drips, it's caught. Every now and then I've accidentally gotten uh, blue paper towel fibers down inside the socket. And I was always able to get it out, but it's also a risk in that sometimes if you're using something, whether it be plastic or metal, to try and pick that out, you can accidentally bend a pin. Now that's not so much a problem because they are in guides, but anything that looks abnormal out of place is cause for concern. Again, it doesn't mean it won't work. It gives you room to haggle on price. And to be honest, this video is kind of a two-parter in terms of the messaging here. It's one, how to not get screwed, and two, it's how to get a better deal. The other things you want to check for, obviously, is that all of the uh, surface-mounted items, pins are not bent or broken. That's obviously going to be like the USB 3.0 pins. These are ones that are notorious for getting bent. Um, that's this big rectangle guy in the bottom right here, and I think, yeah, there's one on the side right there. USB 3.0 plugs are tight. Um, there's a little notch that you need to use to line up when you plug it in, but a lot of people don't pay attention to the direction of that sometimes, and you can see that there's a pin missing in there, in the top right corner of the bottom uh, plug right here, there's a pin missing. So if you try and force that in upside down, you can oftentimes crush the pin down here in the other corner where there would be the blank when you're pushing the thing down. So you wanna make sure that all of those are intact. Make sure your RGB header um, isn't bent and messed up. Same thing with your front panel connectors. Just you want to look at everything. A lot of people will just focus on the main part, like, yep, socket looks good, all right, let's go. And then you go to plug in your front panel connectors or whatever, and there's literally broken off or missing. Now you're gonna be opening up your case, pushing your surface mounted button if it has one to turn on your computer, because you're just, it's not gonna be a fun time if you have to try and figure out a way to get your front panel connector working when there's a broken off pin. 
you'd be surprised how many of these things get broken because when people are doing their cable management and stuff, they're running cables through and it gets hooked on there and they pull the cable through from the backside and just wrench the crap out of that little header, it happens. I've done it before. Fortunately, I've been able to bend them back without a problem. Which brings us to the next point, make sure that they're nice and straight and don't look like they're all curvy like a question mark because someone tried to re-straighten it. And then you're gonna try and re-straighten it more and you're gonna break it and they're gonna be exactly where I just said. So every now and then, I've had some peripherals on older motherboards like bend the actual contact uh, pin inside the USB and then it gets like smooshed back like that. So instead of being flat, it just kind of goes and I've had that happen before. I don't know how it's happened, but I just every now and then I'm like, why won't this go in? And I look and I'm like, how the heck did that get bent? Fortunately, most motherboards these days have lots of USB. So if one takes a dive like that, you have plenty to rely on, but it's obviously something worth checking. Short of turning it on and seeing it work, um, you're always gonna take a chance with a motherboard because things that you can't test without doing a full boot and a full post on it and putting it, all the RAM in there is whether or not all the DIMM slots work, whether or not all the PCIe slots work, and whether or not all the fan headers and all that sort of stuff work. Because things that you can't see without fully loading all the RAM and stuff is whether or not you have a dead channel. I've had brand new motherboards come with a single bad RAM slot. And the thing is you might put in two sticks of RAM and then you find out it doesn't work when you put in four sticks of RAM because there's a bad dim. And then you're just not gonna be happy if that's the case. Uh, but these are things that you just are gonna be taking a risk on uh, because as I started to say with the older motherboards too, a, a common dead thing on a motherboard is fan headers. Fan headers have been built beefier now than ever. But I can tell you right now, I have overloaded fan headers in the past before to where I like to daisy chain a bunch of fans and run them at full speed. Well, there's a certain amperage rating to those fan headers. And if you exceed that, you can blow up the fan header to where it doesn't work anymore. Or in my case, it stopped being controllable. The controller burned out on it by trying to run as much power as it needed to have eight fans daisy chained on a hub that I built. Now, everything I just said for AMD motherboards applies to Intel motherboards. It's just, you're gonna wanna make sure that the actual socket on an Intel motherboard has been protected, has had its cover placed on when it's not used, and it has no bent pins. So we're gonna move on to the last part of the motherboard conversation, which is how was it stored? If it's not obvious by now, I keep the boxes for almost everything. And that's because the way I, when I'm done with it, I put it back in its box. Now this is where you can tell the level of quality that you're getting by the way that they store their parts. How are they presenting it to you? Are they just like, here's a cardboard box and then they dump it out and parts go flying everywhere? Or is it repackaged in a way that it came from the factory? So this X299 Micro, this was actually a part of a system that we built for PDX Land back in like 2016, I think it was. And that was when Jerry came down and we did a little build off. I already have to wonder why the heck I have a, why do I have a heat sink floating around in here? See. I just asked myself a question. Why is there a heat sink floating around in here? So that's obviously what you want to ask that guy. Why is there a heat sink floating around? Did this bounce and cause damage in there? Well, fortunately, this particular motherboard box has this protective tray. Um, does it have the IO shield? That sucks if you don't have it, but it doesn't keep your system from working if you don't care because you can't see the backside anyway. But if you know that USB 3.0s are blue and USB 2.0s are black and always black, or USB 3.0 could be red, depending on the motherboard, um, and you know the layout of your, the color scheme anyways of the audio plugs and which LAN port's what, then you don't technically need it. But it does give you a way to be like, I'm knocking 10 bucks off the price. Here's the protective like foam that was on there. Here's the anti-static bag, that's a big one. Is the motherboard just resting in there in a cardboard box with no anti-static bag? And does it have the socket? This is so light compared to the things I've been... That's right, these are mounted down. To... Okay, so things you wanna check. Why is that loose? I happen to know that there's a screw that goes through there that's part of the mounting mechanism for this case. So that's why this screw is missing. You can actually see, if you look at the bottom right there, Phil zooms in on it, the hole for that goes right through the mounting hole for the standoff. So that's why that one is loose. But as you can see, we've got the mounting cover on there and we're gonna go ahead and pop this off. And as you can see, there's our socket. What's interesting about this one is if you look carefully as I move it, you can see there's a spot where they don't look damaged, but it looks like something might've touched them. Now the thing is, this is, these are two motherboards that we used for a little build off or who could build the computer the fastest. And it was versus Jerry and I. There were some questionable things Jerry did. So I don't know if this was his or mine, 
I don't know why this is off, by the way. It's clearly not on right here. But it honestly looks to me like it would still make contact like it needs to. But if I saw this, quite honestly, as a, as a used buyer, I'm gonna be like, you know, I think I'm gonna move along. Because the problem with bent pins on an Intel motherboard is although they are very fixable, it doesn't mean you're gonna be able to fix it. Because the way the pins work on Intel motherboards is they're springs. They, they kind of go up and then they're like a hook. And then when the CPU goes down, it pushes the hook down and then it makes a good contact with certain pressure against the pins. If they're bent, it might not contact where it needs to. It might contact in between the little pads on the CPU. So this would be a good example of a motherboard to maybe walk away from. And now that I know that those are bent, I'm gonna sort of just push this out of the way over here. We're gonna write that one off as questionable. It needs to be tested. Let's talk about Intel CPU since we've kind of made the roundabout discussion from AMD to Intel. Because the pins are located on the CPU or on the motherboard, not the CPU, you can see these are the contact pads at the bottom of the substrate. And you can see that they're very close together and there's very little space between them. And as such, if those pins are not lined up, it means that your CPU might look like it doesn't work, but it's really the motherboard. Now, other, other things you wanna look at is a CPU um, stock. What I mean by that is, can you still read the numbers on it? A lot of times people will lap their CPUs. And what that means is you take a piece of glass, which is perfectly flat, you take sandpaper, and you sand this down to where it's perfectly flat. Because every single IHS or the heat spreader on top of an Intel CPU is either concaved or dished. Concaved and dished the same thing, or domed. There we go, concaved or domed. They're never perfectly flat. And that's just the nature of the way that they're assembled. Very rarely does it make any sort of a difference to anyone using their computer in a, in a traditional way. When we're doing major overclocking, we need the best cooling we could possibly get. Therefore, we lap them. That does two things. One, it modifies the CPU. So if this were still under a manufacturer's warranty, you're not gonna get it warrantied if something goes wrong with it and it's lapped. Two, it removes the markings. So if you can't turn it on to verify it is a whatever CPU they're saying it is, you've gotta take their word for it. Now, that, I'd like to think everyone's honest, but I don't. So if I can't see this running and I can't see a BIOS that says what it is and how many cores and threads are working, then I'm not gonna buy the CPU. The other thing is you wanna check for any obvious signs of water damage. The bottom right here, if this sees water, will start to discolor. This is a nice green with a very gold uh, shine to it. Now there are areas that look dark around the corners. That's simply because the pad is smaller. So it looks like there's dark spots on there, but it's not. That's just because those particular pin pads are smaller than the ones next to them. For whatever reason, it's just the way it is. But what you wanna look for is any discoloration. Is there what looks like a bed pee stain on here? It's the best way to describe it. It really just becomes an odd shaped discoloration. And that means water pooled in here which could mean it's dead. It doesn't mean it's dead necessarily. Phil and I, during our, ma our major overclocking competitions, have had moisture build up to the point to where it literally created a lake inside the socket. The bottom of my 9980XE has sat submerged in water that killed a CPU because I heated up the CPU too much when bringing the system back up to room temp before turning it off. You don't wanna just turn it off frozen. But I misunderstood Vince's from, from Kingpin, or EVGA's uh, Vince, you know, Kingpin, telling me to turn off the system when you get to about negative 20. I just saw 20. So I rose the system up to 20, which means all the frost turned to water. It pooled inside the CPU socket, killed the motherboard. I thought I killed the CPU. When I took it out and it just dripped water everywhere, I went, well, another one bites the dust. I'll be damned if that CPU didn't work, continue to get us records, and is now what's running Nebula with all the ugly pea stain discoloration on the bottom because it's also sat in puddles of acetone when we were doing LN, or, uh, liquid, no, um, dry ice overclocking. It doesn't mean it's bad, but you need to see it working. Memory, pretty simple. Are all of the pins intact? Are any of the pins damaged? Do they, does any of them look scratched or like they've been... See, these pins, the way they work is, is you've got the substrate again, and then the pins just hook over it. And then they're basically crimped and adhesive down. And then these pins just make a path trace back to the, to the mother... Or the motherboard, the PCB on here, and then they make communication where they need to. So the pins are very capable of sometimes getting caught, uh, not in the motherboard, but just if you're not careful, because you can see right... Well, I guess you can't really see too well. These gold contacts just meet a trace that's on the PCB 
and they're very close together. So if one gets damaged and it's touching the pin next to it, then it's very possible for it to create a short. Phil and I have also had some RAM arrive that had a sticker, like a clear sticker on some of the pins. We have no idea what that was all about, but you want to check for things that just seem odd like that. Um, short of turning it on and seeing it work at its advertised speeds, again, it's a risky take if you can't turn it on and see it working. Nothing says you can't bring your own tower and be like, can I throw this memory in my tower to test it before I buy it? If the buyer has nothing to hide, they'll never say no. I mean, I, I, I don't know about you, I'm comfortable. When I go to sell something and I'm saying, hey, this is what it is, and the guy goes, I'm gonna bring a tower, can I test it? By all means, because if it leaves working, and I see it working, and you see it working, there is no foot to fall back on saying, you sold me something that was bad. Let's talk about coolers. I personally do not recommend buying used AIOs. Go buy a new one, period. With the way AIOs can, um, I can't remember what the actual science term is called, but the evaporation that happens through the tubes, the bottom line is every AIO evaporates something over time, and that creates percolation, aer uh, aeration, and bubbles that are gonna form, obviously, inside the loop. There's no, unless it's like, brand new in packaging and the guy changed his mind and wants to go with something else and is trying to recoup some costs, offer him about 70% of what the sticker or the MSRP currently being sold is or whatever the current pricing is and walk away with a bargain if it's still sealed. Yes, people can re-shrink wrap things, but you'll know if it's been mounted. If the, if the pre-applied paste is still on the AIO, which they all have, you gotta win. Um, but when it comes to air coolers, there's various things you wanna look for. Basically, just make sure all the mounting hardware is there. Make sure that they didn't mount it to an, you know, an Intel system and then they, threw, they lost the screws and they give you the AMD ones. You can buy a new mounting mechanism from the manufacturer, but what you wanna look for is what does the surface of the mounting area look like? Again, was it lapped? Uh, does it have scratches and gouges in it? If, it? if they were just tossing this in a used parts box and it gets scratched and gouged on the section that's gonna be touching your IHS on your CPU, well, we just talked about what a very minor change to the flatness of it can do in terms of cooling. Imagine what a big gap or gouge is gonna do for temperature. Sure, it can be filled in with thermal paste, but the thicker the thermal paste, the less the transfer. If it looks good and shiny like this guy right here, you can still see the machining marks in there, all pretty and stuff, then you're pretty much good to go. There's some other things you can look for, like the Cerakote on here, or ceramic coat. You can see it's a little scratched right here. These are things that aren't gonna matter. Um, that's superficial, that's probably just from the, when I was putting it in, I don't know how I would have scratched it right there. But if you take a look at the mounting surface again, you can see around the edges right here, there's what appears to be a little bit of scratching. That's actually overhang on the particular CPUs that we use this on. This was used on like a standard mainstream CPU. If you're using on an extreme CPU or X series, then that area will touch the CPU. But again, on the very edges like that, it's really not that big of a deal. Can't feel it with my fingernail. Those are just very minor. I wouldn't worry about those. Any big scratches in there, I would worry about. Lastly, let's talk about graphics cards. I know it's the way I started this video, so of course we're gonna end it with the thing you wanted most because viewer retention. These are, the, these are the ones that you definitely are going to want to test. And the thing with graphics cards is with the way they've been leveraged over the last few years in terms of cryptocurrency mining, which is less of a thing today. I don't, yes, cryptocurrency miners are obviously still out there doing their thing. But with the invention of ASICs designed specifically to mine the type of currency that they're mining, have really taken the load off of GPUs and put them onto those specific ASICs you can buy, which were way faster than a GPU when they're designed to do the instruction specific to your currency. So fortunately, that means that our graphics cards are no longer really being sold in, in massive quantities to those people. But those people who've now moved from ASICs to or from GPUs to ASICs are now selling their GPUs. The problem with buying a card that's potentially been mined on is the fact that you don't know the load that card lived at. So oftentimes Bitcoin mining or cryptocurrency miners want to find the most efficient power range at which to run the card that they don't exceed their ROI in terms of their cost of electricity. A lot of people are running big solar systems and stuff to power them, so they might be running them at full tilt all day, every day. They might be only running at 50, 60% every day, which then really, at the end, depending on how much you game, is less of a load than gaming. The bottom line is it's running on and nonstop regardless of the situation, which does eventually degrade the card. Cryptocurrency mining has made a lot of people very afraid to buy used graphics cards. 
Fortunately, if you're looking at buying a graphics card that was built, it, let's say from Pascal or newer, the likelihood of it being a cryptocurrency mining card is very low. A lot of people actually used AMD cards to do cryptocurrency mining because they were just simply better at the uh, hash rate to get more ROI in a much cheaper card. So if you have a card like AMD, like the RX 480, which was a mining monster, um, cost you know 350 bucks, 400 bucks, and they were able to run that thing for years, then they're not going to go to a more expensive NVIDIA card to make less money with a lesser hash rate or lesser hash rate, making less less hash browns. So I'd feel pretty confident in buying an NVIDIA graphics card as it wasn't necessarily a, a cryptocurrency miner. Now, there's some things you're going to want to look for here. Do the fans work? If they've got a graphics card for sale and they're upgrading their card, there's no reason whatsoever they can't show it working in their system. At the very least, have them take a video of it running in their system. And this applies to any of the components here today. Have them take a video of it running in their system. Then have them in, the, in a single take, take that card out of the system and show the serial number on the card. Then when they show up with that card, you can see the serial number matches. They can't pull the serial number sticker off these cards. They're, they're cut in such a way so that if you go to pull it off, half the sticker stays on the card. If they try and pull a quick one on you, they're not gonna be able to do it. So it's just an extra level of precaution. If it's something the buyer is willing to go through for you, they're serious about selling the card, and they're more than likely being honest. The other thing you're gonna to wanna to look for, and this is a very, um, it's controversial because it's actually illegal to do this in the United States, and that is to void warranty for servicing something yourself. For instance, both this EVGA card and this MSI card have stickers on here that are designed to let the manufacturer know if the card has been opened up or, or tampered with or disassembled. The problem here is whether or not that sticker says warranty void if removed. Now this MSI card specifically says warranty void if removed. And it's a sticker right over one of the four screws holding down the cooler on the, uh, the PCB right here. What the f is going on outside? There's a CrossFit gym a couple doors down that they're in the alley right now doing tractor tire flips. I should probably get myself out there. I could probably... <laughs> But okay, if we look at this sticker right here from EVGA, it's covering one of the backplate screws. It doesn't say warranty void if removed. That's where the, the issue becomes. The reason why I'm even talking about this is because if these stickers have been punctured, that's what they're designed to do. They cover a screw. You can't pull the sticker off for the same reason I said for the actual um, serial number. But if that sticker, that sticker, if that sticker's been punctured, you at least as the buyer know this card has come apart. Then ask them. If, I see that you've uh, taken this card apart, why? Uh, dun, 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 um, dun, dun, dun. They start stumbling over their words, then start to be more questionable. Why, okay, what, what was the problem? Did you fix it? Let's see it working. If he was like, I wanted to put better thermal paste in here and it worked, it actually came down blah, blah, blah degrees, and you still have a video of it working or whatever, I would be perfectly fine with buying that card. Most of mine have been taken apart. In fact, Phil noticed that the actual um, part number sticker here with the serial number says warranty void if removed. That's for obvious reasons. You're trying to do something, you're trying to apply it to something else or whatever. Um, so I know this video has been a little bit longer, but the, the thing you should take away from all of this is there are some great deals to be had in the used market. In fact, we've already talked about it. We've got stuff here that we need to get rid of because it's taken up space. It's no longer relevant to our content and that needs to go. And I can tell you right now, almost everything I have here has been used and experimented with in some way. But before I sell anything, I do full testing of it all to make sure it all works. I come up with a fair price and then I'm firm on that price. If someone's firm on their price, then you can probably feel comfortable as well of the fact that it's probably gonna work as advertised. Uh, but like anything electronic, failure is a part of it. Failure happens to all of these parts if they run long enough. But that failure is more than likely not gonna happen in the time frame of which you're gonna own it because we're finding parts that are running 10 plus years now. The, the manufacturing quality is way better than it's ever been. You're getting longer life out of these parts. But I think the major takeaway is see it working if you can. If they're like, well, it's not, an, I don't have a system right now to test it, I sold all the parts. I'll bring my own system, let's do it. And if they really don't want to see you test it, walk away from that and find something else. As good as the deal might seem, how are you gonna feel if you spent $500 on a 2080 Ti just to find out the guy tried to put a water block on it, broke off a transistor and super glued it back on? Uh-oh. 
the other thing I would obviously recommend is if you're buying off Craigslist or whatever, it, you're, it's very difficult to find anyone with any sort of a buyer rating or a score. But if you're buying off eBay, what's that person's history? Do they have a good history or do they have a, some neutrals and negatives in the past six months or a year? If I see those, I immediately become a little bit skeptical of, okay, why does this guy have negatives? Why does he have five negatives in the last 12 months? I don't care if he sold a thousand things. Why does he have five negatives? Most forums now have a buyer feedback system or at least a thread that people will be like, here's my feedback thread, leave feedback here. Or they'll even have like uh, Heatware. I think it's called Heatware, which is a site you can go to and leave transactions based on any form. I've got a Heatware. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to buy used parts, get a good deal and not get ripped off. So what's your best advice for somebody buying used parts? Is it sit there and flip a tire in an alley when someone's trying to make a video? Or is it just use common sense? Comment down below with your best buying guide for, or suggestion anyway, for those buying used parts. And with the 3080 availability, I think the people selling used graphics cards right now just got a little bit of extra sales power, if you will. If you're selling them for 500, I guarantee you there's 600 now. All right guys, thanks for watching. As always, we'll see you in the next one. I'm gonna go put some cards up for sale.